Welcome back to Razmafsar TV. Today I am um, having my, uh, Mark Cherba and uh, so Mike, um, how are you doing? Could you please introduce yourself to our uh, viewers to our, of our channel? Sure, uh, I'm good. It's spring break week for my kids. So uh, it's, it's nice and relaxing, a good time for this. Um, in terms of introductions, um, I run a group called Northwest Armatsari, uh, just outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, and we study a variety of historical fencing, but my main focus is the uh, sword and buckler arts uh, in particular, um, but the martial arts of the nation of Georgia, uh, uh, specifically their weapon arts. Perfect. I mean, um, the reason, one of the main reasons, I mean, we met each other, I met Mark when I was in the United States in the big event, and then I met him and we uh, exchanged ideas. What I'm really fascinated is, first of all, let me ask you, why your interest for Georgia and the martial arts of Georgia? Where does this interest come from? So it, it actually was kind of an accident originally. Um, my, my ancestry is mostly Eastern European, and I'd gone looking for Russian saber manuals because I love sabers. I love, uh, you know, single-handed slashing, cutting, and thrusting weapons. And in the process of looking for that, I found this document um, written in the 1950s by a Georgian uh, fencer and physical education professor named uh, Elishvili um, on a form of sword and buckler fighting uh, from the Kevsereti region of Georgia that had survived in use into his present day. Um, and in fact, uh, when some of my Georgian friends started researching this uh, in the late 90s and into the early 2000s, there were still a few old men left with missing fingers and scars from fighting this. Um, and I just got really fascinated and I ended up translating the document from Russian to English. It was written in Russian because it was Soviet era um, and spending more and more time with it um, because it's just fascinating. Uh, the culture in, in Georgia in general and in Kevsereti and Spinetti and the Highland regions are really interesting. Um, and the arts are just fascinating. Um, and how long they survived in use, you know, makes them a real outlier, which, you know, I think there's a lot that people who study historical fencing in general um, could take from the bits we've managed to preserve, you know, bits of ethnographic footage, bits of, you know, interviews and writings, um, you know, from a more modern perspective. Okay, um, could you, and then um, you came to this conclusion that you started to, um, let's say, preserve this knowledge and then instruct, I mean, to teach this knowledge of how they mainly fought with sabers combined with a buckler or a small shield, correct? Yeah, so, um, and the reason I focus on that combination is that's what we have the best documentation for. Um, Elashvili documented this very completely at, at its most friendly level. Um, he was actually arguing for it to become a sport like fencing. So he stripped out some of the really deadly stuff, which we've had to bring back from other sources. Um, but working on it, it took me a long time, you know, working from sources, uh, speaking with people in Georgia um, who'd observed and researched, um, you know, bringing in things from, uh, to understand uh, from other arts. Um, it was confusing at first. Elashvili himself was a, a classical, classically trained fencer uh, in the Italian style. Um, so he very often uses classical Italian fencing terminology from modern saber, um, which, you know, figuring out how, what he meant by that and translating it back to the heavier weapon. Um, it was not a short process. I mean, it took me at least 10 years of work before I was willing to venture any knowledge about this outside of, you know, the people I was researching with. Um, but eventually we got there and the, the Georgian experts, the, the people that I really respect, you know, telling me, no, 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 Mike, it, it's, it's okay, go, go share this, um, you know, because there's not a whole lot of people doing this. And unfortunately, many of the people who do this in Georgia, if you go 
search for Parakeva or Lashkroba, um, a lot of what you'll get is either a dance um, or you'll get sort of very wushu, fancy tricking, you know, showing off rather than the serious fighting art, which is great if what you want to do is look good and bring people into your school, but not great if what you really want is to preserve the traditional fighting methods and, you know, be able to apply this. Heaven forbid it ever be necessary. You know, we, we never want to use it, but we want to be able to should we have to. And from my point of view, it's extremely interesting because Georgia is very close to Iran and there are lots of exchanges and common history and culture, lots of cultural traits are similar. Um, that's why I'm really, really interested in what you are doing. Could you please tell us before we go ahead, do they, did Georgians have a, like a warrior class? So it's really fascinating. Much of Georgia is sort of your classical feudal culture. You have your, your nobility, who were all warriors. Um, and then you had your, you know, your lower classes, um, who in the case of Georgia tended also to be warriors. Uh, in particular in the highlands, in Kev Seredi and Spinetti, where a lot of these fighting arts were kept al alive a lot longer, was a very egalitarian society. Um, most of Georgia, served a feudal lord who in turn served the king. In Kevsereti, they didn't. Um, they were sort of their, the equivalent of what, you know, most people think of like the English yeoman. Um, they, were, they were free men um, and they served the king directly with no intermediary lords and elected their own village leadership. But in response, uh, sort of in payment for that, they were the border guards of the nation. And when the czar went to war, when the king went to war, the highlands emptied, you know, every able-bodied fighter between the ages of about 14 and 60 came down to fight. Um, and they were known for fighting. There were traditions of blood feud. There were traditions of, uh, I mean, even the holidays became war games, right? There's this fascinating Easter tradition where, right, in many Orthodox cultures, Orthodox Christianity and religion in Kevsereti is interesting. Um, it's a fairly unique form of Christianity dominates, but it has strong pagan elements and strong elements also from both Islam and uh, Judaism. Um, but um, in Orthodox traditions, you don't work on Easter. You prepare all the food the day before. It's blessed by the priest and you have your Easter Sunday feast after mass. In Kev Sereti, there was this game where the young men would go and try and steal the food from houses <laughs> and bring it to the church yard. And if you got away with it, the people you stole from had to serve at the feast. If they caught you, you had to serve at the feast, right? So literally even religious holidays became part of military training. Of course, very interesting. Um, for uh, for I mean for our viewers I mean uh, just uh, what you know about Georgia is always these old beautiful pictures of warriors I, I'm always fascinated when I watch these pictures it, like male armor and then also have cover male armor sometimes covering the whole face yeah it's so fascinating yep. these pictures could you first of all tell us about male armor I have seen uh, original ones when I was invited by Russian colleagues in Saint Petersburg and in Moscow the original ones or was beautiful. Could you tell us, are, uh, have you ever seen this uh, mail? Did you have any experiments on this? Yeah, so I mean, I've, I have uh, owned two different mail shirts personally, um, riveted uh, in different styles and sizes. Um, and, uh, you know, in fighting in it, um, one of the things that I think is really key, especially if you're going to fight the way that the Kevser did, they, they rarely wore anything over the mail, right? Um, that was their primary armor. And two reasons for this in Kevser ready. Uh, one, metal is expensive, right? If you're a, a poor mountain dweller, having a mail shirt is the best bang for your buck. It's, it's re repairable, you can work on it. Um, and Georgia in particular was known for the craftsmanship of their mail. They made excellent 
riveted mail, um, which is part of the reason why so much of it was looted by people who conquered them, because it was good and they took it away. Um, you know, Georgia is not the, as, as tenacious as the warriors were. It's not a large com country and it's right at this sort of very critical crossroads. Um, so they ended up having to being invaded and fighting off invasions or inviting people in to try and help them fight off invasions and then getting stuck with them in charge. Um, but fighting in mail, one thing that I think is really interesting is that in those pictures you refer to, you'll notice that there are always belts, right? There's a belt across the waist, there's belts that crisscross. And those actually help distribute the weight of the mail and bind it to your body to move, right? If you just put a mail hauberk on and try and move around, if you lift your arm, the weight of it will hold your arm down, right? But if you if you put a belt on, kind of blouse it over, so it's got like a little pooch, and then cinch your belt down, right? And then do the same thing and cinch these cross belts down, it will move, it will stay where it's supposed to, and it won't restrict your movement as much. That's right. Uh, so the mail, they were riveted and they made it. And then they have also very nice helmets. I think they have like a bowl on top and then there are mail attached to it. Some of them, right? Yeah, so so there's there are several styles of helmets uh, or, or mail head coverings that are used in the Highlands. So lowland Georgia, you see stuff that looks very Persian, very Turkic, right? Um, more complete helmets. They tend to be pointy on top with the mail hanging. Um, you know, very common to the region. Yes. Up in the mountains, no, they, they basically take a, a round piece of steel and dish it into like a yarmulke and then hang mail off of it. Um, and sometimes those are in, engraved and all sorts of things and they're beautiful. Um, the other thing we see very commonly with these is that either the mail covers leaving an eye gap or everything, or we see a style that's more open and it hangs, so it hangs open around, and the where it hangs down in the front, there will be small hooks on the edges, so you can hook it to your to your hauberk, and then hook it to itself to close up the neck with a double layer. Yeah. Um, Very good. But interestingly, they didn't really wear padding under it either. In most places, you put some kind of arming cap or something on underneath it. And if they weren't wearing one of their traditional caps, they just put the mail on over their hair, um, which is really unusual. Um, and I someday maybe I'll be able to understand why. <laughs> but did they have a padding gambeson below the hauberk? So underneath the hauberk, um, it tended to be less padded and more heavily embroidered heavy wool cloth. Um, especially in Kev Sereti, there's a traditional garment uh, called the Talavari, um, which is basically a very a classic medieval tea tunic um, that hangs. If it's unbelted, it hangs to your knee. And the sides are slit up to the point of your belt. It's heavily embroidered around the edges of the base, around the cuffs of your arm, sometimes bands on the upper arm, and this big heavily embroidered yoke in the front and a little in the back. So they reinforced it um, mostly with embroidery and the heavy cloth rather than layers of padding. Um, occasionally, you would see the mail itself sewn in between two layers of cloth. Um, but unfortunately, this we know from stories. I've been unable to locate an extant suit of mail that way that I can trace back to Georgia or Kev Sereti directly. Oh, you mean two layers in between one layer of mail, correct? Cloth and mail. Cloth, mail, cloth, yeah. Oh, this exactly. is this Qazakand or Qazakand in Persian. That's right, okay. Yeah, well, and, and again, we see examples where, you know, the, the two nations definitely we see overlap. And we know a lot of Georgians um, served in Persia. Um, and had Persian exposure. You know, when Persia ruled Georgia or parts of Georgia at times, it was very common for upper nobles to end up in Persia um, and bring elements of that culture back with them. And Georgia has a very strong tradition of being pan-cultural, right? Many places we see things like 
Christian, Jewish, Muslim sectarian violence. And if you look at Tbilisi, it, it would not, it's not unusual in the capital of Georgia to see you know, a cathedral, a mosque, and a synagogue within a few blocks of each other. Um, and they've been that way for centuries. So this, this again shares this with Iran. In Iran is the same. You see mosques, synagogues, and churches. Um, uh, this is very interesting. Another question I have, have you seen, uh, does Georgia have also traces of Zoroastrianism as Iran does? So there are definitely strong traces of various forms of paganism in the highlands. There are origin myths. Um, many of which are somewhat parallel to what you get from Zoroastrianism. Um, there's less about the duality stuff and what there was seems to have largely gotten wrapped into uh, what the Kevser would call First George, right? So Georgia is named Georgia because people write the association with St. George. Um, but in the mountains, there's St. George and there's First George, right? First George is sort of the association of the remnants of the pre-Christian religion with Christianity. Um, and there are elements of that that can look very much like bits of Zoroastrianism. But I would be hesitant to say that there is a distinct link, you know, as you know, you know more... As more you know, parallel than direct. Because as you know, Zoroastrianism is the first or the oldest monotheistic religion in the world, right? The first, even before Judaism, is right. Zoroastrianism. The first, uh, first monotheistic religion in the world, so Ahura Mazda, great god, and so... And then you see, so in today's Iran, I mean, in every fabric of Iranian history and society, Zoroastrianism is present. doesn't matter if you are... Muslim, Christian, Jewish, I mean, and there are, we have Zoroastrians Zoroastri Zoroastri in Iran, as we have in India, like Parsis who went there. So that's why I was very interested to see if you can see traces of them in Georgia. Yeah, I mean, th there are, and there's there are definitely also traces of things that overlap with uh, the Greek mythos, right? We know that there are ancient ties to Greece. Um, you know, Georgia was the land of the Golden Fleece. Um, you know, which is a reference to the way the Georgians would mine for or gold by some weighting uh, sheep uh, well, fleeces down with rocks in gold bearing streams and leaving them, then taking them out and and carting the gold flake out of the wool. Wow. Um, but we we have there's references to a, a parallel to the Prometheus myth um, where the founding hero ends up chained inside a mountainside um for various you know sins of trying to lift up humanity um there's i mean some of the mythos are really fascinating for for english speakers there's a, a really excellent book i'll send you the link after we talk um on georgian um, mythology and folk tales translated by a uh, professor of georgian language at university of berkeley um and she's done an absolutely fabulous job on it the best thing i found in the english language perfect could you please also now, we talked about uh, uh, I mean, armor, okay, and helmet. Could you tell us about, first of all, let us stick to defense. Okay, I mean, no, shields are not only for defense, but let's talk about the small shield, or as in European terminology, buckler. I mean, I don't like to say buckler for some reasons. Okay, how do they, no, no, so how, I mean, you, how do you call it in Georgian it, uh, uh, shield, by the way? So, so, so here's the, the irony for anybody who knows fencing terminology in English, is the name for that in Georgian is a pari. Very similar to the word peri, right? But pari, like separ, can mean anything from, you know, the size of a small dinner plate up through a large strapped round shield. Um, and all existed at various times. In fact, we see shields um, historically that look very much like the larger separ um, in Georgia. Um, that are strapped both for uh, like a rotella with elbow and grip yes. and also have a set of straps to hold in a center grip Interesting. Um, so that it could be fought with either way. Um, but pari, and then there's one special case, what they call an ubis pari, which is sort of a hideout shield, 
um, which was often worn under your mail, hanging inside your chest. So it acted kind of like a piece of plate over your vitals, but it was also hidden. It was a backup. If you broke or lost, you could get it out and use it. 